everyone, and welcome to the first episode of Why Buy NMR. Joining us today is Hashim Alashimi from the Columbia University in New York. Hashim started out working on NMR methods and then quickly moved on to apply these to study the dynamic nature and related function of nucleic acids. Thanks, Daniel, for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me to join you. And I thought maybe I'll give you three quick uh, short stories that summarize some of the work we've been doing with NMR. One of the things, of course, that we would love to study with NMR is the dynamic nature of nucleic acids. And as we now know, all biomolecules don't fold into one structure, but form an ensemble of many conformational states. And we've been using NMR spectroscopy to illuminate some of these low populated, short lived conformational states. And in one study, we had developed uh, experiments, really applied experiments that had been pioneered to study protein dynamics by labs like Art Palmer, Lewis K, and others. And we were looking at the DNA double helix, just a regular DNA double helix. And in this study, what we discovered was that your regular Watson and Quick base pairs don't exist as Watson and Quick base pairs for all the time, but for 1% to 0.1% of the time, the guanine or the adenine can flip 180 degrees like a coin to generate a completely new base pair called Hookstein base pairs. And we now know Hookstein base pairs are widespread in biology. Uh, they are involved in protein recognition, damage repair, uh, potentially in the mechanisms of mutagenesis. And this has led us into a new path trying to see and sequence, if you will, where are these Hookstein base pairs in genomes and, and what roles are they playing? The real difficulty in visualizing these base pairs, of course, is that they're only there for 0.1% of the time and they're very short lived. And if it wasn't for NMR spectroscopy, something as fundamental as this dynamic motion uh, in one of the most studied molecules of all time, the DNA double helix couldn't have been discovered. The second story uh, relates to sort of the inverse process. This is a Watson Crick base pair, which is normal, becoming an exotic Hookstein base pair. Well, if we start with a GT mismatch, so now this is not the correct base pair, it's a G and a T. Uh, this does not form a regular Watson and Quick conformation. This is the Watson and Quick. The GT forms what's called a wobble. And the fact that this looks like a wobble and not a Watson and Quick is what allows polymerases to replicate DNA with high fidelity. The polymerase knows when there's the wrong base pair in its active site because the geometry of the base pair is not Watson and Crick, it's a wobble, so it knows how to reject it. Yet we know that polymerases make mistakes and GT can be misincorporated with specific probabilities. And of course, these uh, errors, these mutations are fundamental for evolution. We would not exist if polymerases did not make copying errors. And sometimes when these copying errors increase too much, they can cause diseases such as cancer. And so the million dollar question was, how can a polymerase make a mistake? Because after all, the GT wobble is not the right geometry. And many years ago, uh, in studies of the DNA double helix structure back in the 50s, it was proposed that the wobble geometry could occasionally form a Watson and Crick conformation. So G and T could form a Watson and Crick conformation if you had the unusual tautomeric forms of the bases. This is the, the we normally look at the keto, keto forms of the tautomers of the bases, but we learn in biochemistry textbooks that there are these other rare forms called the enolic forms. And indeed what we discovered is that if you take a, a GT wobble in a duplex and apply the same NMR methods that I mentioned, what you can see is that on rare occasions, the GT starts to become like a Watson, a quick base pair through tautomerization of either the G or the T and in addition through ionization of the T. And remarkably, one of those uh, molecules has a conformational state, has a population on the order of 0.01%. So, you know, that if you think about, if you wrap your mind around what this is 0.01%, that's, that's really astronomically low. Yet with the power of NMR, we were able to observe this species. And this is in fact the mutagenic conformational state. And we were able to show that the probability with which the wobble forms the Watson a quick mutagenic form dictates the probability with which the polymerase makes the error. So the dynamics here clocks how often the polymerase makes errors and in a way uh, helps drive uh, the evolution that is so, the, the, the errors that drive evolution. As a last story, I can't not talk about RNA. So these were primarily DNA stories. In the world of RNA, RNA molecules often are helices that are connected by link curves. And what's often observed in RNA is that when the RNA is free, it has one orientation of the helices, but then when it binds to proteins, the orientation of the helices can change. 
And for one RNA molecule from HIV-1, which we study called TAR, many structures by NMR and X-ray showed that this two helices could have assumed many different orientations depending on which ligand bound to TAR. And there was this very large, rich conformational ensemble of different TAR states. And we wondered, does TAR by itself, without the ligands, undergo motions that sweep through all these different states? Or is it that TAR is more or less rigid and these ligands induce different states of the, of the RNA? So we applied now residual dipolar coupling in MR methodology, which looks at the orientation of bond vectors. And with this method, what we were able to observe is that on its own, TAR, without any ligands bound, it samples a very beautiful trajectory where the helices basically twist and bend at the same time. So it, it bends and twists, and we could resolve spatially the dynamic trajectory with the NMR measurements. And this very directional motion is exactly the motion that sweeps through all the ligand bound states of the RNA. And this told us that the inherent ensemble of the RNA carries all the information about the bound states. And this is important for understanding the mechanism of molecular recognition, but also in the efforts of trying to find small molecule drugs which target RNAs in drug discovery. I think many of these studies wouldn't have been possible without the spatial and temporal resolution afforded by a wide variety of NMR methods. And these studies are leading us to do follow-up studies that don't involve NMR, but involve more cell biological work to understand the role of these dynamics in the physiological cellular context. Hashim, thank you very much for taking the time to do this. And of course, thanks everyone for watching. Um, if you want to find out more about Hashim's research and also about his lab, please check the information below this. And also, I hope to see you for the next episode. Thank you very much.